very good Wednesday evening to you. So glad that you could uh, join us via YouTube tonight. Let's pray just before our study. Well, God, that certainly is part of our heart cry tonight. We desire to be good students of the Word of God. We're standing in awe of you again tonight and in awe of your Word. We're sitting in awe. We're bowing in all we are kneeling in all of our great God and our Savior and again your precious word and we so often use this terminology but it comes from the heart I pray that we are a people and this I trust incorporates everyone who is watching and listening tonight I Pray that we are a people whose hearts are cultivated and ready to receive your truth. We want you to take your truth and to plant it into our hearts. And if that's what happens, then we know that it will bear fruit. God, our uh, topic tonight uh, is a grave one, uh, that of divine judgment. And yet, uh, there's an excitement for us from the standpoint that you have given us an awful lot of information in regard to future events and specifically future divine judgment. And each of these uh, tidbits of information, these uh, truths are sort of like uh, biblical puzzle pieces. And so we have the privilege uh, aided by the Spirit of God to put these puzzle pieces together and that's where the excitement is course inherent in all of this too is a deep challenge and we will probably conclude with that in our final prayer but for now Lord uh, find our our hearts right and ready to receive your truth I pray this in Jesus name amen we are at an interesting pause uh, with our study in Psalm 21 and I want to tell you why our study of Psalm 21 has led us to the future divine judgments which take place <clears throat> as a prelude to the millennium, Christ's literal, earthly, 1,000-year reign. And these preludial judgments, in turn, have led us to the various places of judgment <clears throat> that are described and delineated in scripture. And the question, where are the dead? <clears throat> Sorry, my voice will get warmed up here in just a second. So we have been uh, brought to the point and uh, to the place where we would ask and answer the question, actually allow God to answer for us, where are the dead? Where are the wicked dead, that is? Probably more, more fully, where where were the wicked dead, and <clears throat> where are the wicked dead, and where will the wicked dead be? Again, in the Bible, we have various places of judgment and various confinements, and they're sort of like puzzle pieces that we have the privilege of putting together, and that's what we have been and will continue to do tonight. Uh, if you were with us uh, last week, and again, we're meeting under different kind of circumstance tonight, but many of you will have your hand out, and we're certainly going to be uh, working off from that again tonight. We began with uh, a statement, a simple statement made by the late great Greek scholar Kenneth Wiest. He said, and I quote, there are three Greek words in the New Testament translated by the one English word, hell which fact results in some confusion in our thinking. Uh, we've given you, again, many of you would have your hand out, but I've put on the board here these three Greek words, number one, Gehenna, number two, Hades, and number three, Tartarus. So as you're studying your way through the New Testament, as you're reading your way through the New Testament, you come across the English word hell. Uh, standing behind that English word could be one of any three of these Greek terms, Gehenna, Hades, Tartarus. 
we're about to discover, and you probably already know, at least in part, that these are um, distinct from each other. And so again, we're back to this analogy of putting biblical puzzle pieces together, and it's pretty uh, exciting. Last week, we spent our time with uh, Gehenna. Uh, we identified the Gehenna, the Greek word Gehenna corresponds to the Apostle John's lake of fire that he refers to a number of times in the Revelation. Uh, we noted together with firmness that this is the final abode of the wicked. Um, and uh, we made a number of uh, important observations in regard to that including from Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, we know that Gehenna is already in existence. Christ, you may recall, in Matthew 25 and verse 41, he spoke of hell, the lake of fire, Gehenna. He, he spoke of hell as um, being a place that he had prepared for the devil and his angels. Uh, we noted together from a semantical standpoint that the verb prepared is, is in the perfect tense, which means that it was established sometime in the past and has abiding results. So as Christ is teaching um, there in Matthew 25, and he references um, this place of fire, we know that it is uh, at that time already in existence. What's interesting is, although it's already in existence and was at the time of Christ, uh, most theologians believe that it's presently unoccupied. Uh, when we get to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20, we watch the Apostle John, he's writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, superintended by the Spirit, and he prompts us to watch as the beast, the Antichrist, again, these are future events, right? Um, and this is at the end of the tribulation period. Remember, we're talking about those judgments and activities that take place between the tribulation period and the millennium. The Apostle John prompts us to watch as the beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. Again, most theologians believe that they are first, the first to occupy that place. I, I have said a number of times, and I'm restating again tonight, that Gehenna, the lake of fire, is what we usually think of when we talk about hell and rightfully so, but God's going to fine-tune our thinking as we proceed, and I think that'll be a value, uh, a value to us. But this begs the question, then, if Gehenna is already in existence but presently unoccupied, then where presently are the unsaved dead? And that leads us to the second Greek word that is translated hell, namely Hades. Hades, Greek New Testament, corresponds to the Old Testament Sheol. Uh, turn with me to Luke 16, 23, if you would, please. This is a familiar text to you. I am uh, tempted to read, and I, I guess maybe I should do some reading here since we have the time uh, tonight. Again, you're familiar with this, but very significant, the details and information that is given to us here. And, and we're... We, we believe, uh, again, with a, a literal um, and, and grammatical uh, hermeneutic, we, we believe that this isn't uh, a fairy tale. Uh, I, I guess we'll go ahead and read it. Luke uh, 16, beginning with verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day, and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus who was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into note Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, that is Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received the 
thy good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they who would pass from here to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from there. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, and all this detail is so um, instructive for us. I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would ascend him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Interesting, this is Hades. And what's clear from our text here in Luke uh, 16 and verse 23 in particular is that this place consists of two compartments. Again, verse 23, and in Hades he lifted up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So here's Hades and I probably should have shared with you, and we'll do so now before we proceed, that Hades is literally the place of the departed unseen dead. An emphasis on the word unseen, a literal interpretation of the word. The place of the departed unseen dead. What we're able to glean from this text is that it... Uh, that it's comprised uh, of two different compartments, one Abraham's bosom or paradise, as some theologians refer to it. This is where the righteous went to upon their death until up until the time of the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you are a Christian, if you are saved, and you died before Christ's bodily resurrection in time and space history, um, then you would go to Abraham's bosom, and that's obviously what we see happening here with Lazarus. That changes, again, theologians, there's a consensus, I mean, not everybody embraces this, but there is somewhat of a consensus among conservative theologians that that changes uh, at the time of the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, where Christ, according to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8, leads captivity captive. Uh, theologians believe in that Christ at that time takes the souls, the righteous souls uh, of the dead, and, uh, and, and leads them from Abraham's bosom into the very presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and what we would call heaven proper. Um, if that is the case, then the, the compartment dubbed Abraham's bosom is actually presently empty. That's separated. Abraham's bosom was separated by a great gulf from what we really have no choice to, but to call Hades or hell, as the KJV translators uh, give us. And uh, again, emphasis, as we have just read, is on the fact that because of this great gulf, there can't be any um, transfer from one side to the other. And so Abraham's bosom at the, at the time was the place of the righteous departed, and Hades at the time was the place of the unrighteous departed, the unrighteous dead. For us today, we look back at this and we say that Abraham's bosom is empty because of um, Ephesians 4, 8, and even familiar texts like 2 Corinthians 5, 8, which says to the saint now, and this has been in place ever since the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that's our great confidence. This is one thing we know when we breathe our last breath in regard to this earthly soldier we instantaneously go to heaven and into the presence of the very presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is our great hope. So Abraham's bosom is presently empty, but Hades is full and filling. This is where the departed, um, unsaved ha have gone and actually will continue to go. 
What's interesting is when we get to Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, and this will bring some clarification to you, again, the Apostle John prompts us to watch as even Hades is cast into the lake of fire. Hades, distinguished from Gehenna, which is the lake of fire, Hades, the place of the departed dead, two compartments. On the one side, Hades or hell, and on the other, Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom is presently empty because of Christ's resurrection and his activities during that time. Hades, though, has uh, been and will continue to fill up until that day when, according to the Apostle John, even Hades is taken and cast into the lake of fire. In fact, having said all of that to you, um, go ahead and turn with me to Revelation chapter 20 for just a second. Again, very interesting. Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. We've been whisked away into the future, and now we are contemplating the great white throne judgment, which is the judgment pertaining to the unsaved. And I saw a great white throne in him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And watch this, and the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades, hell, Hades, delivered up the dead that were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and Hades, hell, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and you're familiar with verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So Hades, note this well, it is where all of the human, wicked, dead presently are. And for those who are about to die, for those who will be dying yet in regard to this earthly sojourn of ours that die um, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, they will instantaneously go to Hades. I need to note this with you and then give you a clarification in regard to this. We know clearly from Luke 16 that Hades is a place of torment, a place of suffering, a place of pain, a, a, a place of fire. You are not wrong in understanding that when someone presently dies that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, when someone presently dies who has rejected God's gracious and merciful offer of salvation from sin through Christ. You're not wrong in, in, um, in understanding and even speaking that they instantaneously go to hell. The only thing I'm asking of you as we put all of these biblical puzzle pieces together is that you would recognize that Hades, this place of the wicked, dead presently, is going to, at that point in time in the future, going to be actually cast into the lake of fire. And so there's going to be a shift in position in regard to that. We can be assured that as people perish today, that they are experiencing hellfire. There's no question about it. But again, we're being a little bit technical and recognizing that Hades is, is to be distinguished from the Apostle John's lake of fire. So the first Greek word behind the English word hell as we're working our way through the New Testament is Gehenna. It corresponds to the Apostle John's lake of fire. The second Greek word is Hades with this two-compartmented place that... Uh, we read about in Luke chapter 16. And then the third Greek word behind our English word hell is Tartarus. And we read about that in 2 Peter 2.4. So if you would turn there with me, please. 2 Peter 
chapter 2 and verse 4. We have a number of texts that come into play with what we're about to read from Peter here, but this is where, um, where the heart of things are. And, and uh, again, Peter uses the word hell, uh, but the Greek word behind that English word is Tartarus. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, Tartarus, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and we'll pick up verse 5, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Again, puzzle pieces. If you take 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 back to, and if you've been with us here at Calvary, then you're very familiar with this, back to Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, where we read about the sons of God, many believing, including Pastor Tom, that these are actually fallen angels. We read about in Genesis chapter 6, before Noah's flood, we read about the sons of God taking the daughters of men and cohabitating with them and subsequently producing an extremely wicked, violent, and I would say abnormal race, which results in a satanic attempt to so corrupt the human race that Christ would not be able to come through and to it. A masterful move on the part of Satan in an attempt to keep Christ from being able to come. Well, what Peter is talking about here, and he does so not only here, but at the end of his first epistle, and what Jude speaks of in his epistle in verse 6, are these group of angels that God at that time confines. And the place of their judgment is called, in the English, hell, in the Greek, Tartarus, a special place of confinement specifically for the angels who sinned at the time of Noah's flood. So again, one English word hell standing behind it, three different Greek words, each with their own distinction. So again, that's valuable to us as we work our way through the New Testament and certainly desire to properly interpret. Based upon what we have been doing, prompted by our study in Psalm 21 with a view especially to the, prelude, to the preludial judgments that take place just before the millennium, we, I, I want to talk about a fourth place. It is not in scripture referred to as hell, but you're very familiar with it, and there's quite the drama that unfolds in regard to uh, in regard to this place called the abyss. Uh, it, again, to help you in regard to your study, uh, when you come across the word abyss, that is a transliteration from the Greek word. In other words, it is not translated for us by the translators, but rather it comes over into the English with the correspondence spelling. And so this is actually the Greek word. You and I know a Greek word. It's, it's the Greek word abyss. But other times the translators actually translate the word. Sometimes they leave it in its original form, and so we see the word abyss, and other times they translate it for us, and when they do, they translate it as the bottomless pit. I'm talking to you about that with a view to these other places that we've talked about, again, to emphasize the distinction of this place of judgment. So turn uh, with me again to Revelation chapter 20. This is 
uh, yet again one of the judgments that we have just rehearsed because it takes place between the end of the tribulation period and the beginning of the millennium. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit. It's translated for us. That's the word abyss. They translate it for us. The key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Here's this preludial judgment. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. Can you imagine Satan being completely taken out of the way? Can you imagine him for this period of time not being able to do his thing? He puts a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a season. So four places in Scripture, four places of judgment or confinement each with their own distinction, Gehenna, Hades, Tartarus, and the, and the abyss, or the bottomless pit. I'm going to share um, my personal opinion in regard to these things. By the way, one of the questions that our observations up to this point in time beg is where exactly are these places? And I don't know that we can be dogmatic about that, but I can tell you this, especially in regard to Hades and Tartarus. When you look at their usage in the New Testament, it clearly indicates that these are interior to the earth. In fact, with Hades, and this is kind of neat, you may remember that in Numbers chapter 16. In regard to Hades, the place of the departed unseen dead, you may recall that the judgment on Korah, again, an awesome, I mean an awe-inspiring and terrible scene as uh, Korah and his family sought to stand against Moses and Aaron, do you recall? And the judgment quickly came to them, and it was in the form of the earth literally opening up and literally swallowing them down. And the text makes clear that they went to Hades. It's the Old Testament, so it's Sheol. The text makes explicitly clear that they went to Hades, the place of the departed unseen dead. So we know that Hades and Tartarus are interior to the earth. We don't have that specified for us in regard to the other places, but I am offering to you now my personal opinion, and that is that I believe that these are all related, compartmented places. We do have to distinguish with Gehenna because as we've already seen, God takes all of these other places of judgment, including and especially Hades, and casts them into the lake of fire. But my personal opinion is that these are all different related compartments. I wouldn't be surprised at all if all of these are interior to the earth. Part of the reason why I'm emphasizing that to you and part of the reason why we ought to speculate about where these places are is because in such speculation is inherent this rock-solid truth, and that is these places of judgment are real. You and I continue to be joyed and buoyed by the realness of heaven and that is matched by the realness of hell and all of these different places of judgment and confinement. Wow, puzzle pieces, biblical puzzle pieces that we can put together because God has shared with us so many 
things, not only about our eternal home, but also the everlasting place of those who in this earthly sojourn reject the Lord Jesus Christ. I think you agree with me as we conclude tonight, and we will be back next week to re-engage this, but now looking specifically again at our text in Psalm 21, I'm sure you agree with me tonight that we ought to leave this place, we ought to leave our, um, our homes, we ought to leave wherever we may be, we ought to leave being better evangelists, we ought to leave being better witnesses, we ought to leave being better bridge builders. May God help us in regard to that. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for um, this interesting and, and even curious study I continue to uh, revel in the fact that we're studying our way through Psalm 21, this Old Testament text, and, and we have had to pause to consider, because of verses 8 through 12 in particular, we've had to pause and consider all of the different activities that take place as a prelude to the millennium, many of them revolving around judgments. And as we put the judgments together from a biblical standpoint, we're prompted to recognize that there are various places of judgment. And so what it's done is it's opened up the proverbial can of worms, which we so often say, and, and, and it's paved the way for us to consider these things together, and I am glad. And I noted this at the very beginning. There's an excitement to being able, even, even though there obviously is an inherent gravity to this topic of divine judgment, there's, a, there's also an excitement for the Bible student to be able to take all of these biblical puzzle pieces and put them together. And I think you've been helping us to do that. But as we conclude tonight and as we get ready to go about our business, God. I, I pray that it would be with a, a renewed sense of rescuing the perishing. There's clearly two sides to the coin. I mean, we have been wonderfully and miraculously saved, and, and oh, how we should be reveling in our salvation, so rich and free in Christ and Christ alone. One of the reasons why we can handle a study like this is because of the gracious and merciful work that Christ has already done in our lives. We, we, we are escaping these places of judgment, and we're so very thankful for that. But in the same breath, we have to recognize the, the dire the, the dire straits that, that the unsaved find themselves in, and oh God, how we need to be able to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. And, and so stir our hearts in regard to these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.